Hello and welcome back. In this lecture I want to cover joints. Joints are basically uh, points of contact between two or more bones, cartilage in bone, and teeth in bone. When we think of joints we can classify them based on function or structure. So a functional classification in joints would include synarthrotic joint. A synarthrosis is an, an immovable joint. An example of an immovable joint would be between the skull bones that you have in your cranium, and these would be considered sutures. Another type of joint is called an antiarthrosis, and this is a slightly movable joint. An example would be the pubic symphysis, which uh, connects your two coxal bones or pelvic bones together at the front. Um, the diarthrotic joint is a freely movable joint. It's also known as a synovial joint and your elbow would be considered uh, a diarthrotic joint. This gives very, very, very great motion compared to the antiarthrosis and synarthrotic joints. Another way that we can classify joints are based on structural classification, so how they're structurally organized. So a fibrous joint lacks a synovial cavity. It has articulating bones that are held together with dense irregular connective tissue in the form of a ligament and it permits little or no movement. So here we have an example of a, uh, a sutural ligament, which is right here is the ligament holding the two skull bones together. Other examples of these, uh, of these types of joints, these fibrous joints, would be a syndesmosis. So here we can see in between the fibula and the tibia, this would be a ligament there that's holding those two bones kind of together. And then we have a gomphosis, which is a type of joint holding teeth to the underlying bone. And here you can see I'm pointing to the ligament that's holding that uh, particular tooth down. And in this example, the periodontal ligament is the ligament holding the tooth down uh, and in place. We also have as a structural classification, we have cartilaginous joints and cartilaginous joints lack a synovial cavity. The articulating bones are held together with hyaline cartilage or fiber cartilage, and they permit little or no movement. So here are some examples of cartilaginous joints. Um, so the epiphyseal plate or growth plate that you learned about in the skeleton lecture here, which is the point, of, point where in young people the bones grow, that is considered to be a cartilaginous joint, the epiphyseal plate. So there you have your hyaline cartilage that is uh, where the bones are going to be growing. Here you can see the pubic symphysis located between two coxal bones, and that is called a symphysis, and it is a little pad of fiber cartilage that uh, connects those two bones together and allows for a little bit of movement. Another type of symphysis would be the intervertebral discs between your two vertebrae. Um, in your spinal column. So that little pad right there is fiber cartilage and it does cushion the bones from rubbing up against one another. And then finally we have as, as a structural classification a synovial joint. The synovial joint does have a synovial cavity that's why it's considered to be a synovial joint. Um, the articulating bones are held together by articular cartilage. They're also held together with um, excuse me, the articulating bones have a, cu a cushion over top of the surfaces where they articulate cart articular cartilage. That's a hyaline cartilage. They're held together by ligaments. They contain synovial fluid. They have a nerve and blood supply, and they're surrounded by an articular capsule. So in subsequent pictures, I'll show you all these particular elements of a synovial joint. They permit a wide range of motion and they are some of the more problematic joints that we have in the human body because of the wide range of motion that they provide. All right, so here we here see a stereotypical uh, drawing of a joint. And when you have uh, you know, a synovial joint, you have to have articulating bones. So here we have a pair of articulating bones. We then have surrounding those articulating bones, we have a joint capsule or articular capsule that's made of dense irregular connective tissue and it encircles or encapsulates the entire joint. Under that joint capsule there is this thing called the synovial membrane. Here you can see it's in a light pink color or peach color and uh, that uh, synovial membrane 
is a type of connective tissue that produces synovial fluid. So inside of this chamber of this particular joint, there is a fluid called synovial fluid. Synovial fluid is a, is a nourishing fluid. Um, the reason we have synovial fluid is to make a non, to, you know, to make the joint kind of slippery because water's slippery and it's kind of a watery proteinaceous mixture. And, um, and so it also cushions. The articular cartilage that you can see right here caps or c covers the surface of your bones. And this articular cartilage is a hyaline cartilage. And if you remember back, hyaline cartilage is avascular. It does not have a blood supply to it. So another job of the synovial fluid is to uh, nourish the cartilage cells or chondrocytes that are in that cartilage. So every time that you move and, uh, and or exercise, um, the bones kind of compressing together push the synovial fluid into the articular cartilage. So exercise is really good for joints because it nourishes that articular cartilage. And if that articular cartilage doesn't get nourishment, it could, it could be damaged and die. Um, and eventually cause, you know, arthritis. So definitely lifting weights and exercise is really good for that articular cartilage to push the synovial fluid into and nourish those, um, those cartilage cells that are in that articular cartilage. Um, when you warm up, you also produce more synovial fluid. So warming up is really good before doing really hard exercise. So these are the elements of a synovial joint. Now you should always practice, you know, with blank diagrams, things that you're learning in lecture. So here's a blank diagram just showing you some of those elements we just talked about. So you could stop the video at this point and practice uh, what you've just learned. So kind of extending out a little bit more information on, on the synovial joint. Synovial joints often do have bursae and tendon sheets. So bursae and tendon sheets can be found at many uh, different synovial joints, but not every synovial joint has them. So bursae, bursa being singular, is a sac-like structure filled with synovial fluid that cushions the movement of one or more body part over another. And I'll show you a picture of a bursa in just one second. Uh, tendon sheets are tube-like bursa that wrap around tendons that are subject to great to a great deal of friction. And again, I'll show you a picture of a tendon sheet in just one minute. All right, so here's a bursa. So this little fluid-filled packet full of synovial fluid is going to be a cushion. Now you have several different muscles here. So we have this uh, muscle right here called the supraspinatus. And as it comes through, it oftentimes will get pinched by the head of the humerus and or the uh, scapula. So we have a bursa there to essentially protect it from being crushed when you lift your arm um, in this particular direction. So oftentimes that'll get crushed and cause problems as, as we'll talk about when we do the shoulder joint in just a few minutes. All right, so uh, here's a, an example of a tendon sheath. A tendon sheath is going to be located right here and um, this is a place that's kind of interesting. You did study the uh, the greater tubercle and the lesser tubercle and the inner tubercular groove. You studied those when we did the bones. And now you can see that there is a tendon from the biceps that goes through the inner tubercular groove and then it comes around and articulates with the scapula. So um, this tendon sheath, the job of this tendon sheath right here is to wrap around that tendon coming from the biceps so that every time your biceps move and that tendon moves in that intertubercular groove, it doesn't get damaged from that friction of movement. All right, so what I want to do now is take you through a series of, of major types of, of synovial joints in our body and kind of discuss a little bit about them and how they're organized. So um, um, these joints can be very complicated. And what I'll do is I'll take you uh, uh, through a little tour all the way from the bones, and then I'll start adding layers of, of tissues and structure so you can see generally how, it, how a joint is organized all the way up until the skin is covering the, the entire articulation. So I'll start with the elbow joint. Um, this particular joint is known as a hinge joint because the 
bones will move together in a hinge-like fashion. And um, the elbow joint is made of three articulating bones. We have the, uh, the humerus, we have the radius, and we have the ulna. So these are your articulating bones that come together. And down below, I've put a anterior and posterior view of these particular joints. So in the anterior, you can kind of get a sense of some of the parts that we've talked about. So here's the humerus, here's the radius, and here's the ulna, and this is anterior. Here we have the coronoid fossa, the coronoid process. We have the trochlea and the capitulum, and then you have your epicondyles here and here. Uh, on the back surface of the, of the um, or posterior surface, we have the olecranine process of the ulna and the olecranine fossa coming together. Then you can see the head of the radius right there. Okay, so these are your articulating bones that come together to form the elbow joint. So um, here in this particular diagram, you're beginning to see some of the complexity of this. You do have the joint capsule or articular capsule that is encompassing or um, generally speaking, covering the entire joint. And then holding the bones together, we do have various ligaments. Okay, I don't expect you to know all of these different ligaments. That's not something that uh, you're required to know for this class, but I do want you to know how a joint is organized. So you have an articular capsule and you have um, ligaments that are holding bone to bone so that they don't come apart from one another. All right. So in this uh, kind of, uh, I guess you would call it a, a section of this, uh, almost like a, um, a sagittal section of the, uh, of the arm, um, we have all the parts that we learned about in the stereotypical synovial joint. So on the outside surface, you have the joint capsule. So on the inside surface, you have the synovial membrane. And then covering the bones, you have articular cartilage here and here, and then inside of the joint capsule, you have that nourishing fluid, that synovial fluid. Okay, so that's kind of what you see um, in this particular diagram. You may wonder why they called it synovial fluid, but it does have the, the root ove in it. It does kind of have like a, a an egg-like consistency. If you've, if you've ever cracked a chicken egg before and saw the clear part, that's kind of what synovial fluid is like. Okay, so what we've seen so far is the, is the bones that are articulating together. We saw the ligaments holding the bones uh, together, and we saw the joint capsule encompassing the entire, um, this entire joint. So going a little bit further and adding a few further things in, uh, again, there are many ligaments that are going to be wrapping around the joint, holding the bones together. We do have nerves that are going to come across the surface of that joint. Okay, but they don't typically go into the, into the joint capsule, but they're covering over the surface of the joint. And then wrapping around a joint, we oftentimes will have muscle tissue. Here we have the biceps, brachii, and the brachialis. And you can see on the radial tuberosity, um, you can see the biceps uh, 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 tendon um, connecting into that particular joint. So on the anterior side, we have the biceps and brachialis. And then on the... Um, on the back side, of course, we have the triceps, and you can see the triceps does um, join right there at the at the olecranine process um, at that joint. So a joint has muscle tissue oftentimes that wraps um, around it. All right, of course, there it's then fat and skin and uh, and uh, other kinds of connective tissues that are going to be covering the joint. All right, so you kind of have a, a little bit of an understanding now how the elbow joint is uh, is organized. We'll now move on to the knee joint. The knee joint is a joint I want you to know uh, you know uh, the most about so um, so we'll cover that in a little bit more detail than we did the elbow joint. So here we're looking at the knee joint and just to refresh your memory in regards to the bones we have the femur, we have the patella or kneecap, we have the tibia, and then we have the fibula. So in this particular joint, we have right many bones that are articulating together to form the, uh, the joint. All right, so I'm going to show you a sagittal view of the joint first and review the major parts of the, of the synovial joint. 
So to refresh your memory, a synovial joint is going to have a, um, an articular capsule that goes around it. So here we have the articular or joint capsule um, that's made of dense, irregular connective tissue. It's very, very strong in any kind of plane that you pull on it. Uh, underneath that, we have the synovial, uh, the synovial uh, membrane, which makes the synovial fluid. The synovial fluid is in this particular in this particular caption. It's kind of that black fluid that's covering uh, inside there. Um, of course, over the surface of the joints, we have the articular cartilage, which cushions the bones. That's made of hyaline cartilage. Um, so those are your main components. We also are going to have muscles that are going to cover this joint, as you can see here and here, and uh, and there are lots of little places where we have bursa which are going to be fluid-filled packets, which help to uh, to cushion the joint as it's doing its job. And we do have fat that's going to be packed in, little pads of fat that are packed in to aid in cushioning this very complex joint. All right, so let's move on and we'll kind of talk about the tendons, ligaments, and um, menisci that are associated with, uh, with the, uh, the knee joint. And uh, what I did is I copied and pasted some pictures of models here because it's just kind of like nice and easy to kind of see how all this is organized. So um, I'll show you these pictures of models and then show you uh, uh, more of a drawing um, with uh, with, that uh, has a, a little bit more realistic view to it. All right. So if we start up here at the top, we have this tendon right here, which connects your quadriceps, your muscles that um, that are in the front part of your upper leg. Um, this connects it down into the patella and eventually links it down to the uh, into the tibia. So this is the quadriceps tendon. Now you do have the kneecap right here underneath the patella. And when you have a, 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 a connection between a bone and a bone, we call it a ligament. So this particular structure right here is called the patellar ligament. Even though this is a continuous structure, so the quadriceps tendon does go all the way down and connect into the, uh, the tibial tuberosity. Um, even though that is a continuous structure, uh, we do separate it into the, uh, into the quadriceps tendon and the patellar ligament. Okay, just to kind of keep that organized. All right, so that's in the front. In the drawing, I'll show you next, I'll lift this quadriceps tendon and patellar ligament off so you can see deep inside the anterior cruciate ligament. So that won't be a structure I'll be able to show you in this particular uh, in this particular drawing. All right. So next we'll go ahead and do the uh, collateral ligaments. So we have the uh, first of all we have the fibular collateral ligament. Uh, this was also known as the lateral collateral ligament, but today in most books we're starting to see fibular collateral ligament, and it does connect the tibia to the fibula. Okay, from the side view there. So that's called the fibular collateral ligament. Okay, on the uh, opposite side, we have the tibial collateral ligament. So this is connecting the tibia and the femur together. So here we see the tibial collateral ligament. Collateral is a word that we use meaning to the side. So, um, so this is a, a, a ligament that you're seeing connecting bones from a side view. Okay, so next uh, we'll go ahead and do the posterior cruciate ligament. So from the posterior side, we can see this ligament right here, which is holding the femur to the tibia. So again, you can only see this in the posterior view in this particular uh, in these particular model uh, pictures. There are little uh, pads of fiber cartilage which help to uh, to to stop the knee from rocking on top of one another. So probably as you as you remember, we do have these uh, things called condyles here and here on the tibia, and then we have condyles on the femur. Now these condyles are round, and um, if you didn't have little pads of fiber cartilage, then the the femur and the tibia would rock back and forth and not be very stable. But luckily, we do have these little pads of fiber cartilage called menisci. So we do have a lateral meniscus. So this is the meniscus on the lateral side. And then we have the medial meniscus on the medial side. You might ask, how do I know this is the lateral side over here? Well, the fibula 
is on the lateral side. So, um, so that's why we know that this is the lateral meniscus. These little menisci are little pads of fiber, fiber cards. They're almost like donuts. And so the little condyles of the femur and the tibia will sit in those donuts and it helps to stabilize the knee from rocking back and forth. So those are called menisci. So I strongly encourage you to practice on these blank diagrams so you can stop the video and practice and see if you can remember some things that you know. You must always practice. Repetition is a really important thing to learning and memorizing a lot of these parts in anatomy. So here we have more of a drawing view. And uh, just to kind of refresh your memory, we have the, um, the fibular collateral ligament. We have the tibial collateral ligament. Um, we have the patellar ligament. The quadriceps tendon would have come down here, but we've removed it in this particular uh, diagram. Uh, we do have the uh, lateral meniscus and we have the medial meniscus. Those are like little pads of fiber cartilage that are like donuts and uh, allow the, the condyles not to rock back and forth. Um, in, this, in this diagram, you can see a little piece of the posterior cruciate ligament in the back. Cruciate means cross. So these ligaments do cross across one another or look like they cross one another when you look at it from this particular um, drawing view. So the anterior cruciate ligament was one I couldn't show you in the previous drawing, and this is this ligament right here, and it holds the femur to the tibia in the front. So the posterior cruciate ligament held the femur to the, uh, to the tibia kind of in the back surface, and this helps to articulate the bones and hold them together. Okay, so that was a little review of the of the uh, the knee joint. Make sure you go back and practice learning uh, all the menisci, the ligaments, and the tendon, and also look at the sagittal view and practice the parts of the synovial joint. Okay, so let's move on then to the shoulder joint. So the shoulder joint is going to be uh, articulating the humerus and the scapula together. So they will be articulating at this point right here. This is a very complicated joint, and it is probably the joint that gives you the widest range of motion, um, but it's a very complicated joint, and it's very easy for it to disarticulate. So, you know, you've probably heard of people disarticulating their shoulder uh, or falling out of the socket. Okay, so if we take a look at the, at the joint here, um, before I put the joint capsule over top of it, I wanted to talk about this little structure here called the labrum. The labrum is going to be right here at the glenoid cavity of the scapula, and it's a pad of fiber cartilage that acts like a cup. So, um, so it's kind of hard for me to draw it in, but let me give it a little bit of an attempt here. So, so you can see this is like a cup right here. It's a little depression, and then you have a lip that's over the surface. So this is a lip right here. And what this does, this little lip and this little cup allow for the, um, for the humerus, the head of the humerus. So here you can see the head of the humerus. It helps it to kind of stick in and be held into that joint a little bit more strongly. Uh, you can tear a labrum and have to have that surgically repaired. So that's a uh, labrum tear is pretty common in the shoulder joint. Um, so now we'll go ahead and look to see that there are many, many ligaments that are going to be holding this joint together, and it does have a joint capsule encapsulating the surface of that. Okay, so let's look at a, at a kind of a, uh, I guess this would be more of like a coronal cut through the joint. And it has all the parts of the synovial joint that we've talked about. Uh, of course, it's going to have that uh, articular or joint capsule that encompasses or encapsulates in all three dimensions the joint. We do have the synovial membrane here in blue. We do have articular cartilage that are going to be uh, helping to cushion the bones. And we have the synovial uh, fluid. Um, this particular picture is showing you muscle tissue that's wrapping around. And we do have tendons that are going to aid in creating um, creating a structure um, around the, the capsule, the joint capsule, to basically uh, help to, um, to protect it even more. And we call that the rotator cuff. 
So the rotator cuff is a is a problematic area for uh, for the human, um, and the rotator cuff is uh, basically the series of of uh, tendons that uh, that help to uh, to articulate the, the scapula and the humerus together, and also protects and and aids in giving great strength to the joint capsule. Okay, so it's got a lot of purposes to it. Um, this particular thing called the rotator cuff is going to uh, is going to uh, be comprised of these particular muscles. Let's look at posterior view muscles first. So we have the supraspinatus. Here is the spine of the scapula. So supraspinatus is above the spine of the scapula. We have the infraspinatus below the spine of the scapula. So infra means below, spinatus means the spine of the scapula. And then we have the teres, uh, the teres minor right here. Okay, so these are going to have tendons here that are going to be making up that thing that we call the rotator cuff. Let's look at the anterior view. So in the anterior view, you have the supraspinatus, and then we have the subscapularis, and then we have the teres minor. You can see it from the front view, but in the, in, it's not making up the front part of the rotator cuff. So you can see these tendons right here are making up the, the rotator cuff. Um, the rotator cuff is very easily torn. So anybody that lifts things over their heads, uh, oftentimes if it's repetitive, will tear or damage the rotator cuff. There is a problem that you can see right here. We have the acromion. We have the acromion uh, right there. And, um, and you can see the clavicle right here and the humerus is right here. When you lift your, 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 your uh, humerus, when you lift your humerus up, that supraspinatus oftentimes will get pinched uh, in between the scapula and the, hum the head of the humerus. So that's a very problematic area if you lift things over your head. So um, there is a bursa located there to try to protect the supraspinatus. So we can see the bursa right here, that, which is trying to protect the supraspinatus when you lift your arm uh, above your head. But again, um, it, it's only as good as it, as it is. So, um, uh, as you can see in this top drawing right here, here the person's lifting their arm up and you can see that, uh, you can see the bursa being crushed there. Oftentimes you will get an impingement syndrome where the muscle will be damaged from lifting it, um, your, your arm over your head repetitively, uh, you, repetitively. You can also see the rotator cuff tendon can get, uh, can get pinched and again, again, get damaged and torn. Uh, or you can get tendonitis where you get a swelling from, from overuse. So the, again, that supraspinatus coming through this area right here uh, is a problematic area, and that rotator cuff can oftentimes get damaged. Okay, and so let's move on to the hip joint. So the hip joint is made of the uh, coxal bone and the femur articulating together right here at this particular location. And um, the hip joint, like the shoulder joint, does have a labrum. The labrum is that pad of fiber cartilage, which creates a cup that allows for the head of the femur to kind of sit in and 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 be uh, closely articulated with the uh, with the hip bone. Of course, the acetabulum is the part of the coxal bone that articulates with the head of the femur. Okay, so looking at uh, kind of a uh, cut view through here, we can see that this has all the parts of a regular synovial joint. We have the articular or joint capsule. We have the synovial membrane. We have synovial fluid. We have articular cartilage on the ends of the bone. And uh, of course, uh, synovial um, joints are going to have little ligaments holding the bones together. So everything that we see there in a regular synovial joint is located in the hip joint as well. So just to kind of take you through, the hip joint does have, of course, uh, ligaments that are going to be holding these particular parts together. So you can see all the ligaments that are holding the bones together. And um, then we also have muscle tissue that's going to cover over and help to, to uh, hold the, those particular bones together. So all of this muscle tissue is very complicated muscle tissue in the... Um, in the, in the area where the hip joint comes together, all that muscle tissue will aid in anchoring 
the, uh, the leg or femur to the hip bones. Okay, so what we did is we just kind of looked through the elbow joint, we looked at the knee joint, we looked also at the shoulder joint, and we looked at the hip joint. The knee joint uh, is in an elbow joint or two that I really want you to know uh, most about. But the shoulder joint, uh, I want you to really know about that rotator cuff. And then the hip joint, I just kind of reviewed with you. Uh, but don't you don't need to know too much about the hip joint for testing purposes. What we want to do now is talk a little bit about the motions of the body, how the body uh, moves. Every movement of the body has a name to it so that we can communicate with other people different uh, activities that are occurring. Um, so we'll just go through this. You can kind of look at the diagrams and practice this on your own. So if you take and you move your head in a backwards motion, um, that is called hyperextension. If you move and kind of tuck your, your chin in towards your chest, that is called flexion. Flexion is where we move bones close together. Extension is where we move bones further apart from one another. So you can see at the shoulder joint right here, flexion is where you move your arm upwards. Extension is where you move your arm backwards. If we look at the, um, at the upper arm here, so when you move your, um, your forearm closer to your shoulder, that is called flexion. When you move your forearm further away and backwards, that is called extension. Okay, so we can flex and we can extend uh, our fingers. Or, excuse me, or at the wrist, we can take and flex the hand this way or hyperextend it going backwards. We can also take and um, for the for the hip, uh, we can have uh, flexion. Let me go back. Sorry about that. So let me go back. So uh, at the hip, we can have um, at the hip, we can have going backwards extension of the leg going um, this way we can have flexion of the leg okay and if we look at the lower leg so if we're looking at this particular joint right here we can have this joint can go this way which is flexion or this way which would be extension and then you can see lateral flexion is where you basically turn your body or twist your body to the side Okay, so if we look at the shoulder, we have a, a different movement called um, abduction. Ab, A-B, duction is where you're going to basically bring your arm up from the side and move it up uh, parallel to your shoulder. Adduction, A-D-D, is where you're going to bring your arm back down to the side. So we have ab, A-B, duction, arm moving up. Adduction, A-D, duction, arm moving back down closer to the body. We can do that at the wrist joint as well. So you can take and you can move like the pinky side this way, and that's ADD, adduction, or abduction, moving the thumb towards this particular direction. We also have abduction and adduction of the hip. So if we take a look at the, at the hip joint, we can bring the leg up this way. That's abduction, abduction. We can bring the leg back down and that's called, or towards the midline of the body, and that's called adduction. Okay, taking your fingers and spreading them apart is abduction, and then moving the fingers back together is adduction, adduction. Taking your shoulder and rotating it in a 360 degree motion is called circumduction. So you can do that with uh, your at your shoulder joint. You can have circumduction at your shoulder joint, and you can have, let me get my little drawing tool here. So you can have circumduction at your shoulder joint. You can also have circumduction at the hip joint. So that's where you can rotate your leg in a three to 360 degree direction. We also have gliding joints. These are joints between bones like the carpals, uh, where the bones glide across from one another. Um, another kind of uh, joint that we have uh, is the uh, atlantoaxial joint. Uh, it's also kind of known as a, as a rotation joint or a pivot joint, and that's located right there at the neck. So you can see this lady's moving her head from side to side in a rotation. We also have rotations at certain joints. 
Um, so you can rotate at the shoulder joint. You could rotate your arm as you can see her doing back and forth right there. It's not a 360 degree direction, but basically you have a central axis that the, that the bone is, uh, is basically rotating around. Um, you can also rotate at the, uh, excuse me, get lateral rotation at the hip as well. So that's a little bit different than circumduction. Thir circumduction, you're getting 360 degree direction, but in a rotation, you don't get that quite much, that much of, of the, of the movement. So we can also see uh, elevation uh, and depression of the jaw in this particular drawing here. So elevation and uh, depression. You can take the jaw and move it outwards in that protraction, or you can bring it back in in retraction. Uh, we also have different kinds of ways you can rotate um, or move, excuse me, your, your uh, ankle joints. So you can have an inversion, okay, and you can have an eversion. Then also at the ankle joint, we can have dorsiflexion, where you're basically bringing your toes or foot up, plantar flexion, where you're taking your toes down, kind of like where you're pushing down on the ground if you stand on your toes. And then we do have a way where if you take and you, and you, you, uh, you rotate your forearm where you make a bowl of soup or a cup of soup with your, with, with your hand, um, that's called supination. So that's basically rotating your forearm so that the ulna and radius are rotating across one another and you can form a bowl of soup with your hand and supination. Then you can roll your hand so it's down and you can see the back side of it in what we call pronation. Okay, so those are some of the movements. In lab, you'll be working on, uh, on, on doing these movements and, and working on these joints a little bit more. So, aging in the joints. As we age, our joints experience a decreased production of synovial fluid, a thinning of articular cartilage, loss of ligament length and flexibility, and uh, to some degree, some of this is, is programmed, is genetically programmed, and some of it's just due to the physical activity that we did. But lack of physical activity definitely will make uh, our joints age more quickly. So you want to make sure that throughout life, um, you're definitely active, lifting weights, flexing, walking, moving, um, and doing all kinds of stretches. If in, if, uh, the, if all that doesn't work out, then we do have arthroplasty, which is joint replacement surgery, which can be performed to counter some of the effects of, uh, of aging. So, um, so arthroplasty, here we have, um, on the, on the, the left hand side, we're going to take and we're going to remove the ball, uh, or head of the femur and the socket part of the, of the, um, of the coxal bone. And we can take uh, an artificial, make, you know, actually literally surgically implant an artificial head onto the femur, femur by cutting it off. And then we can also cut off or shave the acetabulum and put, you know, a, a new acetabulum in as well. So, um, <coughs> um, um, that can then be surgically implanted and then we, we call that a, a hip replacement. So something else we can do, because uh, hips and knees seem to be um, areas that uh, are are pretty problematic in humans, uh, we can do a knee replacement. This is where we go in and shave off the 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 uh, head, uh, excuse me, the condyles of the femur and the condyles of the tib tibia. Uh, we then replace them with uh, replacement parts. So um, so you can do a total knee replacement, and that's where you just take and replace both the both the uh, the femur and the tibia putting replacement parts in. Oftentimes we'll leave all the stuff. So we'll leave the quadriceps tendon and, and patellar ligament. We'll leave the kneecap. Uh, off, and, but sometimes you can replace the kneecap. In this particular example, they did replace the kneecap. Okay, so that completes this particular lecture on joints. Um, I appreciate your attention and uh, hope you've learned uh, right much from this lecture.